Hey guys, uh, this is a video on how to build your own uh, pulse width modulated laser communication system. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but what it basically means is you're going to take audio, turn it into light or pulses of light. Those pulses will travel some distance away to a receiver uh, and the receiver will pick up the pulses, turn it back into an electrical signal and reconstruct the audio. So this is a good project for demonstrating the concept of free space optical communications, which is uh, used in applications where you can't generally provide some kind of wide link or radio link between a transmitter and receiver, uh, something like in a CBD, where you've got a lot of buildings around and you want to get a direct link from building to building. So I'm going to take you through each module now and just talk a little bit about how it works. Okay, so the first module is the oscillator and its job is to generate a triangle waveform which is going to be used later for referencing. So this is just one particular oscillator circuit you can use. If you'd like to use something like a triple five timer circuit, that's fine, as long as it generates a triangle wave or a sawtooth waveform. So analyzing this circuit, on the left you've got a TL071 which acts as a comparator and its job is to generate a square wave uh, which is established by the voltage divider R4 and R5. So that square wave is going to be applied to the inverting terminal of the second TL071, which is an integrator. So when you apply the mathematical process of integration on a square wave, you're left with a, a ramp or a triangle waveform. Now one of the considerations for this circuit is the operating frequency, and that's basically determined by what you want to sample. So in the case of this circuit, I'm sampling audio, which has a frequency range of up to about 20, 20 kilohertz. Uh, so Nyquist-Shannon theorem, if you haven't heard of it, basically establishes uh, a minimum frequency for sampling if you want to be able to reconstruct that signal back to its original, original condition. And basically the rule is you want to sample two times higher than the absolute maximum frequency to be sampled. So in this case, I want to have at least 40 kilohertz sampling. What I've actually set up is a, about 49 to 50 kilohertz. So it's going to provide fairly good quality, better than your average CD quality, which is about 44 kilohertz. So basically, depending on the application that you're going to use the circuit for, just consider what the maximum sampling frequency is that you're going to need. If it's something like voice, which has a upper frequency of around 3 to 4 kilohertz, then you'd want a sampling rate at around 8 kilohertz, which is what most telephone-based applications use. So the formula for working out the frequencies just appeared in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, so just apply that as you need to. The last thing to mention in this circuit is C3, which is a DC blocking capacitor. That just stops any DC biasing from getting through to the comparator uh, so that both signals being compared are on a level playing field. So the next circuit's fairly straightforward. It's basically the audio input and amplifier. Uh, so on the left, you've got the input jack, which goes directly into a non-inverting op amp. Now, basically, one of the considerations here is that the jack uh, can only accept self-powered devices, so things like iPhones, uh, stereo outputs, computer outputs. If you try and plug in an electric microphone, uh, it won't work because it's not going to supply any power to the microphone. So the signal is going to come into the non-inverting terminal and it's going to be amplified by a factor of between 3 and 4 and that's set up by the voltage divider network of R1 and R2 and the formula to calculate the gain has just appeared. So that's going to provide an output amplitude of around about 5.5 volts and that's important because the output amplitude has to be fairly close to that of the sampling waveform. Uh, this allows for maximum resolution so the last component in the circuit is C1, which is another DC blocking capacitor, and that serves exactly the same purpose as the blocking capacitor at the output of the oscillator.
So the final module in the transmitter is the comparator and the laser driver and this circuit is centered around the LM311 comparator uh, which will be in one of two possible output states and they are positive rail or ground. So both of the aforementioned signals, the audio waveform and the triangle wave, will be compared on terminals 2 and 3. If the audio waveform has a greater amplitude then the comparator will go to positive rail Conversely, if the triangle wave has a higher amplitude, then the comparator will return to Earth. So the best way to demonstrate this is visually, and as you can see here, you've got the three waveforms, the triangle waveform, the audio, and the comparator output. And as you can see, the, the comparator output, or the pulse width, is really dependent on the position of the audio waveform in relation to the triangle wave. So this is how the information is basically modulated into a pulse. Just going back to the uh, comparator circuit, you can see two voltage divider networks, uh, R6, R7, R8 and R9. Their role is basically just to bring the comparator inputs to half VCC, so the comparator can operate over the entire range of the voltage supply. You've also got R10, which is a 1K resistor connected from the output of the LM311 up to the positive voltage supply. Um, this is basically because the LM311 has a open collector configuration on the output. So if you don't have some sort of load on the output, then the signal won't be up to develop. So the other side uh, to this module is the laser driver, which is basically a constant current source established by the LM317. Uh, as you can see, there's a 33 ohm resistor connected between terminals 1 and 2, and that establishes a current of about 40 milliamps for my laser. So if you have a different laser, it's more than likely going to have a different current requirement, and you can calculate that simply just by applying the formula I out equals VREF over R11. And VREF's always going to be constant at 1.25, so all you need to do is transpose that formula to make R11 the subject and it's quite a simple calculation. And the last thing you'll notice on this circuit is an N-channel MOSFET which is connected to the negative terminal of the laser. And basically all that does is as the comparator output uh, pulses uh, positively, it's going to apply a positive voltage to the gate of the MOSFET which acts like a switch and it basically will close that switch and provide an earth to the laser which will then turn it on because the, the positive side always has uh, 40 milliamps trying to get in, uh, once that earth's created, the laser is straight on, and once the earth's taken away, it's straight off. So this is how the whole concept of PWM works. The laser basically turns on and off as it's commanded to by the output of the comparator. So one really important point here is you cannot use some laser pointers because uh, many of them have inbuilt protection circuits that have capacitors and some of those capacitors can really reduce the response time of the laser to the point where it just can't turn on and off fast enough. And in the end, the system is just going to fail and you'll have no information going through. So if you have the choice, go for a laser diode or a laser diode dot module. So the final part of the circuit is the receiver and the light detector. Uh, with the light detector, you can see a photo diode on the left hand side and basically its job is to receive the light from the laser and generate a voltage that's proportional to whether the laser is on or off. It's a fairly small voltage and it's not really of much use yet so it has to go through an amplifier uh, and the first component within that, that amplifier is R2 which is a 10k potentiometer and that's basically just to provide some gain control if the signal is a little bit too strong. Uh, and basically that goes through to the non-inverting input of an LM386 which is quite a common uh, audio amplifier and it's configured uh, to provide a gain of about 50. Uh, if you look at the data sheet for an LM386 you can get all kinds of different gain control uh, but this is fairly good for this application. So the final part of this module is the speaker which also doubles up as the filter which is very convenient because it really simplifies the process of demodulating the PWM back to audio. So the way it filters it is basically through the inductance and self capacitance of the of the external speaker you connect. Um, and basically the speaker has quite significant voice coil inductance at high frequencies and because of this the speaker can't follow the the high speed PWM signal which is up around 50 plus kilohertz. 
and that basically acts as a mechanical low pass filter which separates the audio from the PWM. One final point, uh, the light detector needs to be a photo diode. Don't try and use a uh, light dependent resistor because it just doesn't have a fast enough response time for the circuit. And when you are selecting a photo diode, you want to make sure that it's suitable for the light spectrum that you're using. So in this case, I'm using a visible light laser, therefore I need a, a visible light photo diode.